So my dad has this weird obsession, um, and it's a completely illogical obsession. He loves classic cars. He thinks they're the greatest thing. And he actually defines people's personalities by the cars they drive. So if he's met somebody, and uh, it's 40 years, has gone, 40 years has gone past, and you say, hey, Dad, remember that guy I used to work with? And he goes, no, I don't remember. He goes, can't remember, he, dri he drove the Toyota Corolla. He goes, yeah, yeah, I remember that guy. It was in bad condition. There was a dent in the bumper. He just remembers everything as it, as it is according to cars. But his particular fascination is, is classic cars. And like I said, it's illogical because as business people, classic cars are these ridiculously unsafe, polluting, poor performing, underperforming in many cases, expensive to keep, expensive to buy things that keep on getting more expensive by the day. Their value increases. So if you have a car like this, you're probably sitting on a really interesting asset, although logically it's a pile of junk. Right? So how do we assign value to things like this? Um, you're probably thinking the same thing. You're thinking, well, I wouldn't fall for the, something like that, but you probably own one of these things, <laughs> which means you've paid a premium for something that isn't comparably different to the other items in the market, in that particular market for smartphones. If you held these two things up, uh, this, this phone and, and its, uh, its comparative product side by side and looked at the spec sheets, you wouldn't really be able to tell the difference. But you paid a premium for this. So you fell for it too. We're going to talk a little bit about how you create that today. Uh, you may even own one of these. So I'm not sure who uh, who's, who was kind of smirking, saying, well, I haven't bought the iPhone yet, but you probably own something like this. Um, and what's interesting is that if you compare these things, we'll see that there's only one difference, and that's the price. So we have assigned a value based on the information we have. That's perfect information, right? I mean, this isn't an economic situation where you've got perfect product information about the things in front of you. The same specs, the same performance, and yet we still pay for more. So what is that? Well, it's emotion. And it's the one thing that frustrates everybody in this room. Anybody who's ever started a business, anybody who ever will be in a business, emotions are frustrating because you can't measure them. You don't know how to create them. You don't know how to sustain them. You don't know how to repeat them. And you certainly don't know how to value them. But they're there. And they drive the loyalty and the adoption of all the products that we use. So when we build websites and applications, and when I say applications, I mean things like Twitter or Facebook, um, the more complex systems, the ERP systems, the CRM systems that you guys use every day, and the mobile apps, <coughs> whether it be a game um, or a, a business app, all of those things you've adopted and you've assigned some kind of value to. So what we can see from this is that even in, a, in the world where we have access to perfect information, we don't necessarily understand how that information leads to good design. And as a designer, and as somebody who does design for companies like Renee said, everybody from GE to the startups, it's very difficult for us to understand how that data that's been given to us about the audience, about the cost per acquisition, um, what kind of return on investment we're expecting, how that translates into good design. How do you know that something is going to work? How do you know that a website or an application is going to grab somebody's attention? They're going to get off their bums and do something, engage with it. So we're going to talk a little bit today about how we design for those emotions. And we have to start with how people behave. Now, there's a guy on the other side of the States at Stanford called BJ Fogg, and he talks a lot about persuasion models, getting people to form habits, break habits. And every year he comes up with a different set of ideas, how you do it with video, how you do it with mobile. And recently he said persuasion models need three things. They need motivation, they need the ability to do them, and they need a trigger. So what he's saying is you need a reason or a reward. You need an, something that's easy enough for you to actually do it, so it has to match with your ability level. And then you also want something that's going to trigger that, so an event maybe. Maybe it's a, a you know, it could be a specific event or it could be an, um, a messaging, copywriting, an image, 
that triggers your response. Some of these triggers are familiar to us, pleasure, pain, hope, fear, and in Facebook's case, acceptance or rejection. And this is the model, and this is what it looks like when you, you display it graphically. We're down in the bottom corner here when we haven't engaged with something, and we need to be where the star is. That's the ideal spot for our engagement. But in order to do that, we need a trigger. We need something to get us off our butts. So that's where the trigger comes in. That's the, the pleasure, plain, pain stuff. We also need to make it easy, and we need to make it rewarding. And what BJ Fogg found out is that this is not always a linear process. It's not equal. Sometimes it's more motivation and less ability, and other times it's more ability and less motivation. But in general, what we find is the easier it is, the higher our motivation. So if you make things easy for people to use, they get motivated to do them. So assign the trigger, make it easy for them to use it, and they're motivated to go and do that thing. Everybody's different though, right? So everybody's motivated by different things. Some triggers don't work on some people. Some do. And we all have a fascination for our own personal interests, so we're driven by the things that motivate us. And let's talk about that a little bit in detail later. So, in order to create a perfect or successful web experience, we've got a lot of behavioral stuff to do. We have to meet the goals of the individual, not our goals, the person at the end of that website or web application, the user. We need to meet their expectations as well. So we may have met their goals, but it could have taken longer than they expected, or maybe it cost more than they expected, or maybe it was frustrating because they couldn't find the things that they needed. And then they need to be easy to use as well. So this is my quote for the day. I made this up on Twitter the other day. Successful user experience leads to delight. There's that emotional thing again. Delight isn't a bunch of cool features, it's having the user reach their goals. So repeat after me, I'm not the customer. And this is the most important message. If you're in the product development seat, if you're designing, developing, managing a product or a service, you are not the customer. I don't care whether you're a single shingle consultant or whether you're the head of some big multinational. You are not the customer. Even if you think you are, you might say, oh, but I drive the car that our company builds. You're still not the customer. You still don't have the same considerations they do. You're still not motivated by the same things that they do. So the next time you guys embark on a new project, I recommend having t-shirts printed with this on it, saying, I am not the customer, and make sure that everybody in the room is wearing that so that you don't confuse yourself with the person you're actually marketing to or building a product for or trying to get to initiate some process. So, we're going to do a case study because this is HBS after all. And we're going to look at a client that we worked on recently that faced similar problems to all of these things that we're discussing right now. We, we figured out how to use emotion to drive engagement by 300%. And we weren't even done there. There's a whole story after that as well. So, baseline information that we had, we had an existing site, existing mobile application, existing web application. We had some analytics, and in this world of data and analytics, that's great, right? It's good to have data, except it doesn't help us solve the problem. And we had customer feedback as well. So, this is how we started, and this is what we were told. For every customer that comes to the site and signs up for the service, they sign up for a subscription that earns the company about $30 per month, about $360 a year. And they're getting about 65 customers a day on their current site. This is when we started with them. Unfortunately, those 65 customers were just a small group of people from, or minority from the entire group that actually got to the site through this initial funnel, as it's often called, to the point of purchase. 80% land on the grade. Now, that's pretty normal. You might say, well, that's quite high. It's actually pretty normal and not, not too bad. In fact, if you're getting an 80% abandon rate, you're probably doing okay. So, the first step, and this is now your homework, right? The first, if you're doing something like this, your first step is to ask who, why, and where. This is the most complicated slide, so don't all panic. And you don't need to copy any of this because it's all being videotaped and we're going to have it on the, on, the, uh, on the blog. This is a basic matrix that asks how they use the product, who uses the product, and where they use it. Now, 
generally we do a good job in, in saying who. The persona development, understanding who the customer is. We've got these fancy persona matrices that say this is the demographic. Jane is a 37-year-old housewife and she lives in this neighborhood and drives this car. Terrific, right? I mean, let's do a cardboard cutout and bring it into the room and say this is Jane. I bet you, you've all worked with agencies that do that, right? Hey, this is your customer. The only problem with that is that it doesn't describe Jane's behavior. Good example is we use QuickBooks Online to do our accounting. And if you're 15 or 55 or 35 or 95, the behavior is still the same across that entire application. A cardboard cutout is not going to help you understand anything about the customer. Not one little thing. So you need to understand where it's applied in the real world. In this particular case study, they were using it as fitness training, as a general diet and health application. And they were also using it to plan for events. So I'm getting married, I want to lose weight. I'm going to my school reunion, I've got to lose weight. I'm quitting smoking, there's some kind of deadline associated with that, I've got to get into, back into shape. So these events are not just events like, hey, you know, Christmas is coming around. These are specific life events. Maybe having a baby, a divorce, starting to date again. All of these things are actually triggers in these people's life. The who is specifically who. And we'll get into the emotional content of this. But you have to describe these people as who they describe themselves. Stay-at-home moms. I'm a single woman, but I'm not going to be single for long. Right? So these are important distinctions between 37-year-old Jane cardboard cutout. Where they use this product. Do they use this product on their phone? Do they use it on their iPad? Do they use it in the context of an office at home? What are they using as a device to actually interact with you? Does it need to be different when it's a website than it is when it's a mobile site? Or can it be exactly the same experience? You then take this and you associate the emotions that we were talking about earlier to these different components. So, remember this? Remember BJ Fogg? We start to apply our idea to BJ Fogg's model. We say, triggers are associated with those specifics. So let's go to one of those specifics. One of those groups that this company was focused on bringing to them and converting to a customer were stay-at-home moms who have already raised children, whose children are now old enough not to be at home. Their husbands are working. They've probably gained about 20 to 40 pounds. They're not feeling that great. They're feeling a little bit abandoned. They're not looking after kids, so the kids don't really look after them anymore. You know that kind of thing, like empty nesting feel. And they're starting to think, I'm kind of lonely. The house is empty most of the day. And I want to lose weight, but I don't even know where to go to start that process. Because, as we say, it takes one person to gain the weight, but two to lose it. So these triggers are associated with all these different personality types. Then, we use gamification, which is just a fancy word to say you've got to reward somebody along the way, to get them to interact with the tool step by step. And then we create different funnels for them to go down so that everybody is treated differently. So using BJ Fogg's model, not everybody is going to get to the star with a straight line. Some of them are going to get there because they found an easy route to get there. Some of them are going to get there because they were highly motivated by some event. So what happens at the end of this process is that we start designing a flow. I, I deliberately didn't show you the client's user flow because it's very complicated and involves lots of lines and things and this is, not a, this is not a lecture and it's too late for that. But you get the idea here. There's different paths to the end. Some people need step-by-step hand-holding. It's okay to add more steps into the process. If your web designer says, we've got to take out all the steps in the process and make it a one-click option, you're losing half your customers because some of those customers want their hands held. They want to be led step by step through the process. They're scared. They're nervous. They don't know what to do. They're scared they're going to mess up. Give them small incremental steps. Reward them along the way. Others are bold. We actually define these people as the control freaks. They don't want any hand-holding. They're not interested in your help. They just want to go straight to the end. They want to sign up, credit card, we're done. You give them that option. So the big breakthrough here 
is that different people want a different website, a different experience. Now, several years ago, that would have been difficult to, to create because you would have literally had to create different websites. Now we've got great technology. We've got things like jQuery and all these interactive tools that allow us to change the state of the website depending on who you are and what state you're in. So if you're in that nervous state and you click, I need my handheld, it gives you a different experience. If you say I'm a control freak, it gives you a totally different experience. So these different experiences are now possible to create. And so you serve up what they want. They spend $100,000 on the site, 300% in, in, increase in conversions, and went from 65 to 195 customers per day. Return on that investment, on that $100,000, less than a month. Yeah? True story. <coughs> But that was only half the problem. Then we find out that there's a 20% churn rate. All those people that we spent so much time and effort and expense getting through the door and signing up, 20% of them are leaving. They don't want to stick around. They're dissatisfied. This is just as much of a problem, right? Because you've spent all your money acquiring them. Maybe you, exp you spent your venture capitalist money, but you spent money. <laughs> and now you've got this problem where they're leaving. So 5,000 of the 25,000 that they're getting every year are leaving. It's costing them a lot of money. So now what we've got is two funnels. We've got a multi-channel funnel, engaging them and exciting them. So that was the one you saw earlier. But then we follow on with a re-engagement. We want to further delight them. We want to encourage them to stay. And we do that by giving them lots of little things to do. Unlock this. Open that. Get this reward. You can do it with badges, you can do it with rewards, you can do it with financial incentives. It doesn't really matter. The, the right business model will come to you as you start experimenting with things. You need to keep encouraging them to stay. This is a very, very fickle web world that we live in. As Jeff Bezos says, our clients are as fickle as the next deal. They don't care that you're Amazon. They don't care who you are. They just want to know, can they get the best deal? And if you're not engaging them, and if you're not making an emotional contact with them, they're leaving. Yankee Group released a paper today that said mobile carriers in Europe are losing, are churning customers in the same way that, that, that I'm talking about now at a rate that's almost unsustainable. The ones that aren't are doing it through communication. They're picking up the phone, they're emailing, they're tweeting, they're getting on Facebook. They're communicating with their clients just like you would expect to do with your big brain that's evolved to do the exact same thing with another human being. So, they spent an additional $100,000, they reduced the churn by 50%, and that reduced that loss by almost a million dollars. But there's more. Because they reduced the churn, because they made it a more engaging um, interaction, they were able to reduce the call center costs, and their address costs, and their direct marketing costs. So, if you think about the traditional approach, it's, let's get something out the door, and then if things go wrong and it doesn't work out quite the way we expected, we'll just market more. We'll spend more money on marketing. Oh, and we'll support the people that are unhappy. So I don't know, you know, most of you now have the opportunity to complain about stuff. If you don't like it, you can go on Twitter and complain about it. And now there's a person in charge of Twitter to listen to your complaints and respond to you. So if I phone the Comcast call center, like I did the other day, and they don't respond, they don't pick up, or they keep me on hold, they keep you know, moving me around. I tweet it, and within a second, I get a call from the executive office, which I'm sure is just another call center, that says, we saw your complaint and we'd like to help you. So now there's an expense on Comcast side that's looking out for my complaint. That's their job. They're waiting for me to complain. This is how companies are set up today. So why not do it the opposite way around? Why not spend more time on the product so that you're not disappointing, you're not creating dissatisfied customers, you're not requiring somebody to sit at Twitter waiting for that complaint, and then you reduce all the other costs. It seems obvious, but we don't do it like that. And it's part of the hangover of the way we've developed things. It used to be really expensive to create infrastructure, so that's, we just did. We spent some money on some infrastructure, we didn't look at the clients, and if they didn't like it, tough. We just spent $17 million on you, stop complaining. So how do you guys get there? How do you understand this stuff well enough to actually apply to your own business? The first thing you need to do 
is remove the administrative debris from your websites and your applications. Things that are important to you, there you go. This guy, Edward Tufte, wrote, I think, three or four books. If you get an opportunity to go to any one of these seminars, which he does around the world and he comes back to Boston every year, highly recommend it. Edward Tufte, his name's up there. Best, best lecture, lecturer that I've ever seen in my life. So what are we doing? We've got to remove the stuff that's important to us and focus on the things that are important to our customers. Here's an example. This is the BBC website. I took this screenshot today. Uh, this is the, the science and environmental section. I'm a bit of a geek, so I'm interested in the cosmology stuff. There's a lot of stuff going on on this website. What's the most interesting thing on this website? Well, I clicked on it. That's pretty cool looking. That's a really interesting image. And then I thought to myself, what if it just the image was the experience. So I redesigned the website. So this is what I think the science and environment section should look like. That's the first thing I see when I open it up. If you guys have used Flipboard or Editions or something like that on your iPad, this is the kind of experience you get. You get the, the full page experience. So why can't the website be like that? If I need to, I can use the navigation at the top and drop it down and go to the section I want to. Now, I know this is like an extreme model. I don't actually expect that this would ever work and didn't support advertising either, but this is, this is where you should be thinking starting point is. Not the crap that we just looked at where there's so much administrative debris that you can't, can't actually focus on anything, never mind the one thing that you want to get. Plus you should be able to customize it. So let's look at some examples of how sites have done this successfully. Does anybody know this company, Square Up? Square Up. Okay. They, um, they've come up with a solution, this, uh, this little white thing here that uh, fits into your phone, and that's a little piece of hardware that uh, is associated with an iPhone app, and you can now take credit card transactions. And all you need to do is um, create an account, get the little device, which I think is free, I believe, um, and you can just swipe your card. So why is this such a good website? Well, it just described all that. I mean, I went to the trouble of describing it, but it actually does a pretty good job of describing it to you. The other thing you'll notice is there's no navigation really. Where's the traditional bar across the top that says about us, about us, about us, about us, right? It's normally the biggest thing on everybody's site. They have this tiny little navigation piece on the side here that if you click, it takes you to another very simple page. It gives you a little bit more information. And you can slowly find your way down the site in a hierarchy that's acceptable to the customer. So if I'm one of those analytical pain in the butts that needs every tiny little detail about something before I buy it, I can do that. I can dig my way down that mine. But if I just want the initial experience, that's what I got. I got that one page. And it focuses on the product, on the experience, and not on the business. They don't care who your president is. They don't care what your press release said. They, don't, they want to buy it for themselves. They're not buying it because you guys are cool. They're buying it because the product makes them better at what they do. It's another site that I, I like. Very, very simple. In fact, and I'd love to show this, but unfortunately, uh, because it's a Microsoft thing and not a Mac thing, I couldn't do it. But this was, if you go to the Path site, it actually starts playing immediately. So you kind of get this, this video effect that you don't even need to ask it to tell you what it does. It starts showing you. This hand just comes up and starts showing you what part does. Isn't that what it should be? Explain to me how it works for me, what it does for me. Okay, so we've been to the cosmological stuff. Now we're coming all the way back to down to Earth. And um, Nancy, you unknowingly sent us your website. And we're going we're gonna to have a little chat about that. So, in all fairness, you know, you're a single shingle person, not a big corporation, so, you know, we're just picking on Nancy right now. But let's look at some of the things on this site that, that could be improved. Well, the first thing that struck me is that the word dynamic discussions just looks like copy. It doesn't look like a logo, so I wasn't sure whether that was a piece of copywriting or whether it was a logo itself. Um, and then you've got all this cool stuff here on the, when the number two is on the right-hand side there. But 
I'm not quite sure what that is either. It doesn't say this is what we do or this is how we should do it. It maybe even looks like a bit of a quote because it's got that little piece down in it. So at first glance, it might even be a quote. And we've got a lot of navigation. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight across the top. And there's just one of you, right? And you've got eight navigation, you've got eight pages to talk about the things that you do. Now, I don't know much about your business, but I don't think you need eight pages to talk about what you do. You could probably get away with a very long page. I have 20 employees and we have a very long page, and that's it. Dynamic Discussions Inc. is just the same name again, so it's the same font, same name. Now I'm thinking, I'm sure it's not the logo now. Now I'm sure it's not the name of the company, because now it's like, it's mentioned twice. Maybe it's a story about this company that you wrote. Maybe you're an, a journalist or an author and you've written a story. Then you've got upcoming events, but immediately underneath that you've got a book. So are you promoting a book or an event? Or an event about a book? Yes, event about a book. So why don't you say that? We're going to talk about this book at the next event. Use language that human beings understand. Right? We're, not, we're not in an age where we can use telepathy to communicate yet. It's coming. But right now what we need to do is actually explain to people what it is we do using the language that you would use in a conversation with them. And then you've got all this stuff at the bottom, which I think is superfluous. It's, it's redundant. You don't need all of that additional information. One of our designers actually took a stab at improving the site. Now, she was only given a couple of hours, so it's not perfect. But the idea here is that simplifying stuff. You make the logo look like a logo. So we make it bolder, we use a different font, we separate it from the navigation. We reduce the number of navigation links. I could have done it more, but I think we, you know, mm -hmm. good. And we've also focused on your three areas of competency. Okay. You've, really, that's your th business, it's divided into three sections. So that's exactly what's happening here. And this, this would be a revolving piece of real estate on the top that would go from dynamic discussions to dynamic presentations to dynamic seminars. Okay? And you may even just go discussions, presentations, seminars. You may not even need to do the whole nine yards. Then it says, book being discussed. Yeah? It actually says that. No surprises. And then we've got some cool stuff at the bottom. That's the least important stuff. We're going to throw it down at the bottom and we're going to make it a different color so that visually we're telling the story, this is not important. If you are that anal that you need to know this much about me, fine. But it's really not important. If you don't get what I'm all about right now with this small bit of information, then that's it. So we actually came up with two separate designs. You notice this one just has the call to action on the right hand side. This one has it across the bottom. But now we've got a very specific call to action. A presentation of what you do saying, we do peer-to-peer -peer discussions of books and articles that introduce new ideas. So we actually say what you do, and then there's a call to action. Learn now. Give people a direction. They want to know where you want them to go. In fact, there was a great study about if you, um, if you say, follow me, and then you say, please follow me, and you say, follow me right now, and then, you know, if you just keep, kept adding adjectives and, you know, expletives and things, people would just keep on, you know, going higher and higher conversion rates. So now we've created a hierarchy where things make more sense. It starts at the top and it goes down. Easy for the eye to understand. So how does this help you today? Well, I appeal to you, go out and create beautiful things. Not just things that work, things that are just as attractive as that classic old car is to my father. Sure, it's really, really expensive, and it's silly to own a supercar like that because it's unsafe and it pollutes the air and it's expensive to repair. But oh my God, driving in that car is just the most amazing thing in the world. If you could drive in that car right now instead of a Prius, you would. Okay, not right now, it's winter, but beautiful sunny day. That car says more about you than any other car that's on the road right now. It's beautiful. These words are important because they're subjective. 
appealing, alluring, subjective words. What do they mean for your customer, for them? Now, if you are a Harley Davidson driving guy with tattoos and a shaved head and a goatee, what you find alluring and appealing is going to be very different from, you know, the Lily Pulitzer wearing Nantucket vacationing young lady. Okay? Two different segments. Although I think maybe to piss off her parents you might. <laughs> but you get the idea. Everything's different from everybody. So what's appealing to your customers? What's alluring to them? Emotionally, not functionally, emotionally, because if you can build that into your product, into your experience, What's, ex you know, what's the experience for your customers? What do they come away with after a dynamic discussion? What's the reward for them? And you'll know it because it feels different. When you pick up an iPhone, it feels different from a Blackberry. It looks different. It, e it has emotion to it. It's deliberate. Okay, think about all the beautiful things that have ever been created. Those things are not just random. They're beautifully designed for a reason. This is, you know, we're in Boston, so I thought I'd just throw this one in. This is my last <coughs> slide. Such a beautiful, weird, quirky looking thing that gave us instant gratification. When this thing came out, it was the most radical design of its day. It gave us an emotional fix that we couldn't get from any other camera. It was weird looking, but it gave us that instant gratification fix that we were looking so desperately for. And now we take it for granted. Polaroid started a whole generation of instant gratification cameras. This, this reaction that we have to things is both emotional but also intellectual. <laughs> because at an instant level it's emotional, but at a deeper level it still needs to work, it still needs to function, it still needs to be something of value to us. So that Polaroid camera, emotively you look at it and you go, whoa, it's so cool, it's interesting, and then you go, and it gives me a picture instantly. Now that's something I want to use. Same thing with your iPhone. Same thing with any of the products that you see on the market today that are getting people's attention. So data is important. And I'm a scientist, so I know how important data is. It cannot be ignored. But it can't solve the problem. It can only tell you where the problem is. And when it highlights the problem, it makes it easier for you to design a solution. But in this analytics obsessed world that we live in don't get bamboozled by the data if you've got piles of data on your desk you're only halfway there the solution is not apparent until you've figured out where the gaps are and designed a solution